Hello, and welcome to my presentation. I've titled my talk today, The Virtuoso's Perspective, and it's an analysis of Berio's eighth sequenza for violin solo through the lenses of uh, the anxiety of influence with an attempt to ground analysis in a poetic uh, analysis of Berio's concept of virtuosity. So I'll give a brief background on the sequences as a whole. Then I will talk about the foundations for my analysis. I'll discuss previous work, uh, particularly Eugene Montague's chapter on sequence eight. Then I will uh, go into more detail on my own framework and its relation to the anxiety of influence. And finally, I'll trace it through the piece with some musical examples. So the sequences are a series of 14 solo works for virtually every Western solo instrument composed over the course of several decades of Berio's life. These are hugely important for the contemporary repertoire. You can see on the screen some quotes about these, but they are really titanic pieces that um, are thought to have redefined in instrumental writing for their instruments. Now, virtuosity for Berio was a huge part of the ideas of these sequences. So he talks about how through these sequences, he's tried to develop a musical commentary between the virtuoso and the instrument uh, to really create a language of virtuosity. And he defines virtuosity as the kind of most obvious and external element that unifies all of his sequences. Therefore, I've taken virtuosity and particular Berio's idea of virtuosity as a kind of grounding priority for my analysis. Now, we're taking Berio's concept as a starting point here. So we ought to first uh, try and do some exegesis to figure out exactly what that is. Now, Berio says that virtuosity is born from this conflict between the musical idea and the instrument. In other words, he's presenting this kind of dualist view of uh, music. Now, I'm comparing here uh, Taruskin's definition of virtuosity, where he calls the virtuosity a highly accomplished musician um, whose technical accomplishments were so pronounced as to dazzle the public. Now, we can see here with this more detailed quote about virtuosity that Berio is talking about what he calls this virtuosity of consapevolezza, of awareness or consciousness or sensibility, a kind of situating oneself in modernity so as to resolve the tensions between yesterday and today. So clearly when one um, is talking about what this is, technical prowess, dazzling the audience is a necessary component, but it's insufficient. We might imagine a kind of philosophical example where we could imagine a sort of zombie who is able to play, say, the violin incredibly technically brilliantly, but lacks any kind of self-consciousness. Now, that would be enough to meet Taruskin's, I think, um, pretty standard definition of virtuosity, but it lacks the element of self-consciousness about art that sets Berio's definition here apart. So, really, this idea of virtuosity is a way of situating oneself as a performer and an artist in modernity, to situate ourselves with the past and synthesize really here the canon of the past, yesterday's creativity, with the contemporary tradition, today's creativity. In other words, virtuosity is rooted in this psychological struggle, both in the kind of dualistic struggle, this Faustian dilemma that he mentions between our material means and the kind of transcendent aims of the musical ideas, but also in terms of present versus past. Now, this kind of dualistic view of struggle is actually quite evident in Sequenza 8. Um, this idea of conflict comes about most obviously, I think, in the kind of two polarities in this piece between A4 and B4. Um, 
these two pitches. Now, Berio writes in his note to the piece that they act as a compass in this work's diversified and elaborate itinerary. Um, in other words, these two pitches and the relationship between them is a kind of compass, a key to the work, whose, uh, whose progress throughout the piece we can analyze with A4 and B4 as a lens. So now I'm going to talk briefly about a previous analysis of Sequenza 8. This is Eugene Montague's The Compass of Communications in Sequenza 8 for Violet. Now he compares these two notes to uh, the eponymous pendulum in Echo's novel Foucault's Pendulum. Now, Notwithstanding the fact that um, Berio did have a relationship to Echo's work, de dedicating works to him, including um, Naturale, but the problem with Montague's analysis is that he analyzes this dyad between A4 and B4 as a kind of static unit. The compass as a whole has a changing role in his view, and the dyad becomes integrated into its surrounding music, and thus into the musical history of the violin. Now, because he sets this kind of dichotomy between the dyad and non-dyadic pitches surrounding it, the dyad becomes a kind of prime matter. Treating that as the um, primary unit of analysis, the dyad as a whole, makes it more difficult to understand the relationship between A4 and B4 within that dyad. In other words, using the dyad itself as a semiotic object that symbolizes, in this case, the kind of historical meta-narrative, um, this idea of a progressive history of the violin or of music, also displaces the role of the performing virtuoso as agent. In other words, the resolving of the tensions between yesterday and today that comes across through the dyad is a kind of archaeology of digging through the piece, not an active act of performance. When the compass is treated thus as static, it takes away the freedom to, as the virtuoso, play with that dyad itself. Now, this isn't just an empty kind of conceptual question, because, in fact, the middle section of the work is semi-open, to use Echo's term for the open work. Now, this section, as you can see in figure one, consists of uh, six phrases that can be repeated in an order of the performer's choice, with some stipulations like that an uh, audible pattern doesn't get repeated. Now, each of these little segments has, to my ear, a kind of polarity versus A or towards B. For example, the first segment, segment one, feels like it has this pitch center of A4. Now, in contrast, the fifth segment, for example, more strongly emphasizes B4. Now, noting that all of these emphasize A4 or B4 to varying but different degrees, the order in which one plays them and the amount of each particular segment that one chooses to play creates a real difference on our perception of which note of the dyad is more prominent during this section. In other words, the performer, each performer of this piece, has an active role in determining the balance of these two dyadic pitches within this section, which makes up a large part of this piece. Thus, I search for an analytic lens that allows us to um, really better interrogate the relation between A4 and B4, their kind of conflict and resolution throughout the piece instead of treating them as a kind of static syntactical unit. 
So my analytic lens treats them as individual syntactic units instead. Now, I also put as a priority for this that we use uh, Berio's concept of virtuosity to understand this in the context of the broader sequences. So how then ought we understand the tension between yesterday and today through this relationship between A4 and B4 that serves as a guide to the piece? Here, I uh, draw on resources from Harold Bloom's concept of anxiety of influence. The quote I have here is Kevin Corson's gloss of Bloom uh, to translate it to a musical context. He says that poetry becomes a psychic battlefield, an Oedipal struggle against one's poetic fathers. Poetry becomes a mode of psychic defense. In this case, music becomes this kind of psychic battlefield between the poet and the precursor. So this piece begins uh, in a manner that I would liken to Bloom's concept of the innocence of Tharmas. First of all, the starting pitch of A4 is important. Even those without perfect pitch almost certainly have pitch memory of this. It's the, it's, the, it's the pitch that we use to tune in almost every concert. Now, Berio here goes through A4 in every combination in which it can be played on the violin, from the G string to the A string to the D string to the double and triple stops. This is of course, as a unison, consonant and harmonious, but it's also static. Just like how before the fall, man has this kind of innocent, pre-reflective state, this kind of unaware subjectivity that doesn't have any object. Now, suddenly though, B4 is, dis is introduced as dissonance. It also breaks up the, um, the metrical stability of this passage, and I refer here to uh, Montague's chapter, which outlines how the B4s are placed in such ways as to break up the phrase always into uneven units. So while we might feel like uh, the beginning could be heard in four, the B4s make that hearing impossible. Now, this B4 dissonance kind of takes over the sonority of A4. Uh, figure three and four show the ends of um, the first major section of the first page and then, uh, and then the end of the like, larger A section in this piece. And you can hear that although it seems like it could almost resolve on that uh, A trichord, instead the B fights back and we end on B, which prompts the uh, next section of the kind of um, faux polyphony barrelage. And so on. Similarly, you can see at the end of the first system in figure four, that it seems again as though it's a resolution on A4, but then right after that at a heightened tempo, dissonance and tension uh, is reintroduced. We have severe dynamic fluctuations, and then we finally end on this sustained tremolo on, on B4. In other words, uh, A keeps trying to take back over after this uh, dissonant Im imposition of B, but is continually subjugated. This leads me to read B4 as 
Bloom's idea of the covering cherub. He says that the covering cherub is a demon of continuity, which imprisons the present and the past and reduces a world of differences into a grayness of uniformity. If the poet grappling with the anxiety of influence seeks to distinguish himself from the past, to misread the past in order to make himself original, the covering cherub makes this impossible. It absorbs the current poet into a continuity with the past, denies him originality, and denies him discontinuity. Now, in this case, the A keeps trying to win out to end these sections on its own, and yet the covering cherub of B denies that possibility, um, taking back control and ending these sections on B. Now, this is perhaps the strongest, I think, implication of this kind of covering cherub. Now, at the uh, bottom of uh, page four, we have a kind of re reprise of this original material of these dissonant quarter note uh, chords, which is then followed by this uh, progression. Now, this G sharp, A sharp, B natural, uh, sequence is repeated several times across this excerpt. Now, this implies a diatonic motion towards B natural. Uh, in other words, it can be read as the sixth and seventh scale degree in B major, and then the tonic of B, implying a really strong home tonality of B for really the first time in this piece that we have this kind of tonal illusion. Now, uh, at the end of this same page in figure six, we have this same sequence inverted on this uh, bottom voice. which is the same intervals as um, zero uh, plus two plus one inverted. So minus two minus one ending on an A. In other words, this is a kind of inversion of what creates this strong tonal illusion towards B. This really matches Bloom's description of the weak poet's response, a kind of failed attempt to grapple with uh, the precursor. This inversion, the evil be thou my good, is uh, what Bloom calls childish inversion, the kind of perpetual student who doesn't add an original contribution, but simply mirrors and inverts the precursor. So what is the strong solution? Here I turn towards Bloom's sixth of the revisionary ratios, Apophrodites, the return of the dead. This is where the poet, rather than being forced to open up his work, intentionally holds it open to the precursor, which makes us then read the precursor poet in this kind of uncanny way as though it is in fact derivative of the future work. So this, the um, end of the kind of large middle section of the sequenza has often been called uh, the apparent victory of B in this conflict. Uh, this last reprise of the um, accented fortissimo quarter note um, 
uh, motif from the beginning now completely settles on B. It is here that Apophrates takes place, and uh, I see figure eight at the very beginning as the kind of clearest statement of this. What appears to be the total victory of the precursor is instead the poets holding it open. We hear B intoned quickly, and then this high A played force as a harmonic. This has the effect of making the A almost sound like an overtone of B, instead now of the inversion from before of the poet copying the precursor, it now seems like the poet, the A, is within the subconscious of the precursor, as if the poet was in fact influencing the precursor the whole time. And thus, at the end, we're faced with exactly the same pitches as the beginning an A4 and then the dyad A4 and B4 uh, combined. And yet we hear it now as a natural outgrowth of that A natural instead of as a dissonance imposed onto it. This analysis through the uh, concepts of anxiety of influence and uh, reading this piece through the uh, pitches of A4 and B4 seeks to add a uh, narrative analysis of Sequenza 8 that uh, lets us more fully interrogate A4 and B4 as key to the work instead of viewing them as a kind of static dyad in comparison to the rest of the piece. We can examine their relation between each other as kind of generative process for this work. Thank you.